Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London, and these are the stories that set your agenda. Stocks in Asia follow Wall Street lower, with big tech making and taking a big hit. As Meta's earnings report spooks investors, the yen extends declines beyond 155 per dollar as the BOJ meets. Mining giant BHP approaches rival Anglo-American with a takeover offer in a move that could spark the biggest shakeup in the industry in a decade. Plus, the avalanche of earnings begins in Europe with much of the focus on this morning's data around the banks, starting with Deutsche Bank. And it is a redhead crossing the screen on that lender, Germany's largest lender, coming in with a beat for its in fixed income trading team. There had been an expectation they would do well, and they have outstripped their U.S. peers with the fixed income trading sales and trading revenue coming in above the estimates, 2.52 billion euros, above the estimates of 2.41 billion billion. In terms of revenue, the bank seeing 2024 revenue slightly higher year on year. So it's a beat on the revenue front. And importantly, it's the fixed income trading team of Deutsche Bank that's doing the heavy lifting in the latest quarter with that beat in terms of sales and trading revenue. In terms of the fourth, in terms of 2024, the private bank revenue is essentially flat year on year. And in terms of their expectations, 2024 around FIC, so fixed income and currency trading revenue, slightly higher year on year is the expectation. The bank sees the full year CET1 ratio to remain essentially flat as well year on year. Again, in terms of the net revenue, 7.78 billion euros net revenue in the first quarter for Deutsche Bank. The estimates had been for 7.73 billion, so it's a small beat in terms of the revenue as well. But again, the importance of the focus on the fixed income trading part of the business. Adjusted costs as well. We know that was in focus for analysts, 5 billion euros in the first quarter. Later this hour, we are going to be hearing from James von Moltke, Deutsche Bank's CFO. That conversation at 6.30 a.m. Staying on the banking space, but switching to the French bank. BNP Paribas, the redhead on this one, and it's a different story for BNP Paribas versus their counterpart at Deutsche Bank, because the first quarter, fixed income, currencies and commodities, sales and trading revenue coming in below the estimates. It's a miss for BNP Paribas on that front. Revenue coming in at 1.6 billion euros in terms of FICC sales and trading. The estimates have been for 1.74 billion, so a miss on that front. In terms of the revenue for BNP in the first quarter, uh, coming in at 12.48 billion, slightly above the estimates. So on the revenue front of the first quarter, it was a beat for BNP Paribas. But again, there will be some concern around the softness in the fixed income trading part of that business. Not a huge surprise. It had been a concern for analysts leading up to this earnings drop. But we're going to get more detail again with the CFO of that French lender on the markets today show. That interview, 7.15 a.m. UK time. We're also going to bring you the earnings coming through from Nestle as well. A focus on volumes, a focus on prices for this business. The stock has been struggling and the details as well coming through uh, from this, of course, provider uh, globally, of course, of all things from nutrition ingredients to food sources as well. Those results are coming through. Uh, we're expecting, in fact, Nestle first quarter organic revenue. The numbers coming in up 1.4%. The estimates had been for an increase of just shy of 3%. So it's a big miss in terms of first quarter organic revenue for Nestle. In terms of the four-year organic revenue forecast for the full year, they still see an increase of about 4%. The estimates have been for 4.1%. So modest, modest miss in terms of the organic revenue outlook there for Nestle. They still see a strong rebound in terms of the second quarter, potentially first quarter sales coming in uh, just below the estimates as well for Nestle. Meanwhile, when it comes to semiconductors, SD Micro, we know there's been focus on the inventories around some of the chips in the industrial space and autos as well. They see full year net revenue of 14 to 15 billion dollars below the estimates of 16.2 billion. So there'll be some disappointment there you would expect from some investors in terms of the expectations around full year net revenue coming from ST Micro. Gross margins coming below the estimates as well. 40% versus 42.4% was the estimates. Second quarter net revenue coming in at 3.2 billion also a miss versus the estimates. So that concern can 
continues around the inventory build-up around some of these industrial and auto chips, it seems, for SD Micro. Now, let's check in on these markets briefly. There's a focus in the currency space on the yen. We'll get the details on that shortly. But, of course, there was disappointment around the meta results. The quarterly earnings, actually pretty decent, but it was the outlook coming through from Mark Zuckerberg and the uptick in spend, particularly around AI, that caused that after-hours slump in the stock. We continue to unpack that story for you. So the ripple across across the tech space, and you're feeling that in Europe as well. European futures pointing lower by just shy of two-tenths of percent. FTSE 100 futures currently flat. S&P futures pointing lower by seven-tenths of a percent. NASDAQ futures looking at a drop, a look at that, of 1.2 percent. Let's flip the board and look across that set then. We had another Treasury auction yesterday, relatively well absorbed, not as well as the two-year earlier on in the week. The U.S. 10-year currently at 464. The Japanese yen crossing below that 155 level, the biggest drop you've seen uh, in three decades against most of the other major G7 currencies. $88 a barrel on Brent, up two-tenths of a percent. Let's get the detail on the yen story then and intervention watch with Avril Hong standing by in Singapore. Avril. Yeah, the way that U.S. yields moved overnight, little wonder why we saw the dollar-yen at those levels we haven't seen since June 1990. And back then, when it breached 155, it was a matter of a couple of days before it then breached 160. Now, we're seeing seemingly that pace of depreciation of the Japanese currency picking up as to whether it meets the finance ministry's criteria for intervention of rapid movement. That's another question. The finance minister, for his part, uh, speaking in parliament today, saying he cannot comment on the forex moves, although they're watching it very closely. And why he can't say much? Well, it's got to do with the BOJ, that meeting underway. Flip the board. Let's take a look at what we're seeing on the yen, not just against the greenback, but also against the Aussie and the euro, that weakness coming through there. So some actually see this as yet another reason why the finance minister might have to step in. Indeed, they see this coming in post-BOJ, where the central banks not expected to move on rates but could send more hawkish signals just because of the yen depreciation and the timing of it all as well. Because don't forget, we have US PCE numbers coming in late Friday night Asia time. And then on Monday, a holiday in Japan. So it would be, as some analysts say, perilous for the finance ministry not to move. That's for the board. I want to take you to what we're seeing in Asia stocks. There is a diverge but what stands out is how quickly sentiment can turn today. The losses on the Nikkei, on the Kospi, are no thanks to what we heard from Meta, but we're seeing Chinese stocks pull ahead. Tom. Avril Hong in Singapore, thank you very much indeed with the Asian market check and a focus, of course, on yen intervention. Meanwhile, a big day in terms of deal making, potential deal making. BHP then making an unsolicited takeover bid for Anglo American in what could be the biggest shakeup of the global mining industry in over a decade. For more on this Bloomberg scoop, let's bring commodities reporter Martin Ritchie. Martin, how potentially significant would this tie up be? Uh, yes, it is a, a very big deal uh, for the mining industry, and it could be one of the biggest m and &E deals uh, transactions uh, this year, uh, as you said, Tom. Um, look, this deal, I would say the top line is it's all about copper. Uh, the company BHP that is bidding for Anglo is one of the world's biggest copper producers. And in fact, if this deal goes ahead, it will become the world's biggest by quite a clear margin, I think. So... Um, if you've been following the commodity space, you, you find a lot of miners uh, trying to muscle in on copper because they see this uh, decade of demand booming uh, ahead of us. Um, you've seen uh, Rio Tinto try and build uh, uh, its copper assets. Uh, you've seen Glencore, the big international trader and miner, um, try to take over tech resources, trying to get copper. Um, and now this uh, is set to be one of the uh, biggest transactions in the mining space uh, in many years. OK, Bloomberg's Martin Ritchie with some of the detail around that potential tie-up between BHP making that bid for Anglo-American. We continue to watch that story, of course, at is, as it evolves. Uh, thank you, Martin. Now, disappointing earnings from Meta. Have investors on edge ahead of results, of course, from Alphabet and Microsoft later today. Meta plunging 15% post-market after its second quarter sales forecast missed estimates. 
and it announced plans to spend billions more than expected on AI development. Let's bring in markets today anchor Kriti Gupta for the details. Um, Kriti, what stood out to you? The disappointment around the spending plans. I'm having deja vu when it comes to meta right. platforms because this is something that they talk about over and over again. These big projects that meta platforms chooses to take on, they put all this money behind it with a time horizon that becomes very hazy and that's where you're starting to see investors very shaky because they've seen this movie before. They saw it with the metaverse. They saw it uh, as well uh, when it comes to kind of virtual reality for, for meta as well, not to mention simply the rebranding and trying to track on a, a more youthful demographic. Uh, apparently no one uses Facebook anymore. Someone forgot to tell me. But I think what's important about this as well is that they're doing that yet again when it comes to the AI space. And that's really where you're seeing a lot of this. What's interesting, though, it's coming amid a background where a lot of these big tech names are rallying on that AI phrase, meta not getting in on that. And I think it sets a really interesting precedent for some of the other big tech names as well that have very different businesses that are perhaps more adjusted and more uh, kind of vulnerable to the AI space, which brings to the forefront the Microsoft and Alphabet story. They're reporting after the bell today. Microsoft specifically Specifically, when it comes to that cloud revenue growth, remember that Azure business is significant, not to mention their 49% stake in open AI as well. So it's really about the growth there. For Alphabet, it's a little bit of a different story in that they need to reclaim that market share. Microsoft, AWS, they are the major players. They are the dominant players in the cloud space, only getting bigger by that AI spend in a way and able to capitalize on it in a way that Meta has not. Now, Alphabet has to kind of prove its own worth and say, it can do the same. And that's why that cloud market share is so important. Can Alphabet then compete with the big boys, quote unquote, with Microsoft and AWS? OK, Kriti Gupta, anchor, of course, at Marxist Today, breaking down the detail around the meta story and, of course, the investor disappointment around those spending plans and setting us up as well for another big day of tech earnings. Kriti, thank you. Talking of tech, coming up, AI unicorn Synthesia unveils its new generation of AI avatars. The company's CEO joining me next for an exclusive conversation. Stay with us later as well. Anders Oppidal, the Equinor CEO, joins me as the energy giant reports a revenue beat. That interview at 6.40 a.m. We'll get his views, of course, on gas and oil prices as well. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, AI unicorn Synthesia is unveiling its new generation of AI avatars today. The UK-based company says so-called expressive avatars, and you can see them on the screen now, can react emotionally to whatever they are required to say, resulting in ever more human-like digital twins, so-called digital twins. The NVIDIA-backed company saw its valuation hit $1 billion last year when it raised $90 million in its latest funding round. Joining me now, I'm very pleased to say, is the CEO and founder of Synthesia, Victor Rippard Bailey. Uh, Victor, good morning. Thanks for joining us on set. Really appreciate it. Bright and early. Um, another update. It's a major upgrade for you and for the business. What, what, are the, what are the applications? What are the use cases for this? And what, what have your customers, clients been saying so far? It's early days, I know. Sure. But what do you expect the response to be? And what does it tell us about the ambitions of Synthesia? Well, so what we're seeing so far, and we have seen for the last three years after we released the first version of these avatar technologies, is that found an initial great use case for them. I think most people that saw those videos, I think we've had an amazing avatar view as well, mm -hmm. would say that they're great, but they're not, it's not one-to-one -one with a real video yet, right? But as we approach that, we unlock more and more use cases. So with the beta test that we've done so far with these avatars that can show emotion, they can sound more empathetic, they can be friendly, they can be upbeat. We unlock a lot of new use cases. Healthcare is a huge one. We see a lot of interest in companies wanting to build more personalized uh, patient messaging, for example, where this type of technology is really, really useful. We're seeing sales and marketing really begin to open up as these avatars are able to be a bit more excited and have a bit more energy than what they have had before. So it, it's a big step for us. Um, it's the first version of this technology based on our Express One model, which essentially is a model that has sort of decoded the relationship between what we say and how we say it with our tone of voice, facial expressions, so on and so forth. And I think by the end of this year, we'll be much, much closer to being able to generate um, more advanced types of video instead of someone just talking at the screen, mm -hmm. actually walking around rooms, having conversations. And the more we, we go down that path, the more use cases ultimately be unlocked with, with AI video. Okay, and that can happen as soon as, this, as soon as the end of this year. Mm -hmm. So we're going to listen in now, take a little bit of a sound bite for what some of your video, what at least some of these avatars can do, just to give the, the viewers yeah. an example. So let's take a listen and then I'll follow up with a question. I am very happy. 
I am so upset. I am frustrated. Okay, so you can see you can see the emotion going through there. So you feed these avatars text, and they react emotionally um, to that. Look, this is something we've talked about before. I know this is a question you get all the time, but we get this we get this wow factor when we see this text. We saw that in the newsroom when we revealed yeah. these yesterday. Some some of the producers, the wow factor, and then it's followed by the fear factor. Yeah. Is society ready for this kind of technology? Do you think, Victor? I think it is, but I think you know. Rolling this out in a responsible manner is incredibly important. And for us, it's, it's really important to actually be the leading company in terms of responsible AI around video, which is, which is kind of our sector, right? So we treat safety as a product inside of Synthesia. It's around 10% of the headcount that works just on this. It is automatic systems and algorithms, but it's also humans who essentially make sure that our systems are not uh, misused. So I think, as we've talked about before, right, these technologies will be used by bad people. Mm -hmm. They will do bad things with them, and we need to do what we can to make sure that, that they don't. Um, for us, it's important to take leadership in this. I think if you look at the general industry, there are some players who take this very seriously. There are other players who take it less seriously. I hope we can set a great example so that everyone who's commercial developing these technologies and have the state of the art of these technologies uh, truly care about making sure they're not yeah. issues. Okay, so 10% of the workforce focused on some of these, the, these risk issues and these safety issues. Yeah. It's, a, it's a big year, of course, for elections here in the UK, sure. in the US and also well, India as well, predominantly. Is, is there anything you're doing specifically around, around potential misuse in, in this big election year? So, I mean, content moderation is a continuous evolving product for us, right? Uh, one of the things we've done um, in the last six to nine months is take a restrictive approach to news-like content, um, which means that if you're creating current events or news-like content, you need to be an enterprise customer, which means that we know who you are, we know that you're a reputable company. Um, and that is, to some extent, you know, trade-off that, that also have negative impacts. There's lots of, like, uh, great uh, people who do journalism who it doesn't necessarily work at a big company. But we think it's the right thing to do to be a bit restrictive on these technologies until society is kind of adapted to it properly, right? And I think that's, that is happening rapidly, but uh, we believe that's still the right thing. To do. And you, you touched on some of your competitors. Who, who do you see as your main competitors right now? I think there's a bunch of companies. There's some startups. There's some bigger companies. Like, this is clearly, I think everyone understands now that this technology is very valuable. It's going to be a huge market build around it, and people are approaching it from different sides. There are some, some companies going more for like the bottom end of the market, uh, which generally means more focus on sort of social media content. They have a lot less safeguards. Um, we are more focused on the enterprise market, but we're also beginning to see big tech companies <clears throat> beginning to begin to showcase early iteration of this tech, right? So yeah. th I what, think that's great. What advantages do you see that Synthesia has versus, for example, OpenAI's Sora, which is a text-to-video yeah. uh, product that they have? So in general, we, we don't see ourselves as a deep research company building foundational models, right? OpenAI, I think, wants to be the company that provides the infrastructure for other companies to build on top of. We sit at the applied layer. We're very focused on a very specific use case, which is talking head-style content for enterprise use cases. So, you know, Something like Asara is like, give me a video of a dog running on the beach with a paraglider in the background. Uh, that's not really what we operate in. We operate much more in building a product for the enterprise where you can create fantastic uh, videos for patient communications or training or sales and so on. So I think as long as we focus on our kind of sliver of the world, we can be the best at that. And that is, goes much further than just the AI models. Ultimately, people buy products, not just access to AI models. And that's where we play, right? Like the, the model is a big mm. component of the product. But I think what we'll see this year is that the companies that win out are the companies that build real products, that solve real problems. Um, and I think we'll move away from this very AI model-centric view of the world, which the last 12 months have been this model, that model, this model, that yeah. model, right? Like, I think, I think ultimately, you know, when the dust settles, people buy products, people want to solve problems in their business. They don't just want to buy technology for the sake of technology. Well, and, and look, you allude to this. You, you guys set up in 2017. You've been mm -hmm. around doing this for, for a long time. Between, before all this froth, arguably, came, kind of came to the fore. The sugar rush of the funding into, into AI. Right. Um, you look at companies like Mistral over in France. They're at a $5 billion valuation now after, like, what, 12 months or something? Is this, yeah. are, we, are, we in a, are we in a bubble at this point? <laughs> um, I think you could say there are bubble tendencies. I think, you know, what, what we're seeing right now is that so traditional SaaS has become, for investors, very boring, not very attractive. Multiples is like mm -hmm. basically any other business, right? Um, focus is now on AI. I think to some extent, you know, investors and founders are probably kind of redoing some of the things that led to what happened in 2021 with the bubble kind of burst. I think AI is a very real shift in technology. I'll give you one example of this. Last year, I think, was a year of experimentation. Lots of companies, everybody was piling in to try out these things, right? 
which they also did with you know, VR, AR, and all the kind of previous crypto and other kind of bubbles we've been through. Um, and this is going to be the year of AI letdowns. But I'm seeing the enterprises that even though people have done pilot projects, a lot of them have not lived up to the expectations, people are running more pilot projects. That was not the case with VR, AR, and crypto, okay. where people sort of let it down. So I think the value yeah. is definitely there. Valuations, maybe a little bit out of whack. But I think over the long term, AI is going to be truly transformational. Really, really interesting. Victor Ripperbelli, CEO of Synthesia, thank you very much indeed. The last time I spoke to you, you said I had about a two-year timeline before I was replaced by one of your avatars. It sounds like that time frame <laughs> has shortened. Victor, thank you very much you, indeed sir. with the latest generation of their AI avatars. Plenty more coming up. We continue to keep across all these earnings for you. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Happy Thursday. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak. We have a big day, of course, on the earnings front. We're going to get the latest lines for you. Crossed in the last couple of minutes from Pernod Ricard, of course, the company behind the likes of Absolute, Beef Eater and Malibu, the drinks and liquor maker. And it's a sizable miss in terms of third quarter organic sales from this company. Coming in flat, 0% in terms of third quarter organic sales. The estimates had been that they'd see a pickup, an increase of 2.8%. That did not happen. In terms of what's happening regionally, we know there's a focus on the Americas, LATAM, of course, within that mix. Third quarter, America's organic sales contracting by 7%. The estimates had been that it would contract by just shy of 4%. Third quarter sales overall for Perno Ricard coming in at 2.35 billion euros, below the estimates of 2.48. We know there's a challenge as well in terms of the drawdown from some of their customers, the build-up of inventories, particularly in the the US and the Chinese market had been in focus as well. The interim dividend per share, 2.35 euros. Coming up, Deutsche Bank's first quarter FIC sales and trading revenue beating estimates. Our interview with James von Moltke, Deutsche Bank CFO, is next. Do not miss that. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. Stocks in Asia follow Wall Street lower with big tech taking a big hit as Meta's earnings report spooks investors. The yen, meanwhile, extends declines beyond 155 per dollar as the BOJ meets. Mining giant BHP approaches rival Anglo-American with a takeover offer in a move that could spark the biggest shakeup in the industry in a decade. Plus, the avalanche of earnings begins in Europe with a tale of two lenders. Deutsche Bank's fixed income trading revenue beats, but at BNP, FICC traders trail for a fourth straight quarter. Let's recap those Deutsche Bank earnings then, because the key one that jumped out, as we said in the headlines, the first quarter fixed income sales and trading revenue coming in at a pretty solid beat for the team over at Deutsche Bank, 2.52 billion euros. The estimates have been for 2.41 billion euros. Don't forget, in terms of the stock performance as well, this stock is up, what, around close to 62% in the last 12 months. The broader picture when it comes to Deutsche Bank, first quarter net revenue coming in at 7.78 billion euros, again above the estimates, modestly above, but still a beat. The estimates had been for 7.73 billion. And in terms of their outlook for 2024, they're seeing revenue slightly higher for 2024 year on year. But again, it's the fixed income team that did the heavy lifting as the lending part of the business was a little softer and Deutsche Bank outperformed many of their US rivals as well. First quarter adjusted costs, by the way, 5 billion euros. We've been speaking to Deutsche Bank CFO James Malka. Take a listen. And the market tends to focus on the investment bank. We're pleased, we're very pleased with the results there. 13% up year on year. Um, our FIC business and also within that the financing business doing very well. Uh, origination advisory for the corporate finance products for us also quite well at 54% up year on year. Um, so we see very strong momentum and, and client engagement there. Um, we've, we're also seeing resilience and growth across the other three businesses. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's nice to have a shining star, but, but seeing resilience um, 
on the more balance sheet sensitive businesses of our corporate bank and private bank is, is encouraging. And there's also fee and commission income growth there. Um, and asset is under management and, and revenues in our asset management business also growing strongly. So we're encouraged by the momentum we're seeing across the business. And casting us a little bit into the future, I should say the recent past in April, what have you seen in terms of fees and trading there? Look, I think the, the trends from Q1 have continued into, into April. Um, in, our, in our fixed income and currencies businesses, um, that would really be a slower macro environment. Volatility has been relatively low. Um, but but continued momentum in in credit trading and and emerging markets and so that's been a, a, a an okay mix for us. Um, we do think the, that the recovery in the wallet in corporate finance will will continue across the year. Q1 was obviously very strong in debt products, so investment grade and, and a recovery in non investment grade. Um, we we do expect that to to continue and hopefully see see a, a further recovery in, in M and A and equity activity. And so you take us to M and A and IPOs and the animal spirits within Europe. Obviously, we have the rate story sort of percolating here. Are, are the animal spirits back in Europe? Last time we spoke, you're very optimistic on M and A. Has that come through? They're coming see, back. Yeah. yeah. If you look at announced volume in the first quarter, that that has recovered. Obviously, the the, the, the fee revenue that that generates is is, is always delayed, but um, but we're that that trend is there. To be fair, it's been you know more reticent than than I would have expected, especially mm -hmm. with equity markets sort of sort of at all time highs. Um, so I think there's a degree of uncertainty still out there, as you mentioned, um, path of rates and 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 geopolitical uncertainties. So there are some things still holding the animal spirits back a little bit, but but the the momentum is there. And before we get to rates, I want to talk quickly about just trading. Given how you've outperformed and FIC, particularly versus the U.S. peers, are you looking to build that business out further? Perhaps doing more on U.S. rates. We've been investing steadily over the years, so so no dramatic change. But I think a continued targeted investment. Ram Nayak and his team have been very deliberate. In, in just filling in gaps that we have. We've talked about Flow Credit, for example, where we've, we've made investments around the globe and that, that is showing through. We, we have and continue to invest, as you say, in U.S. rates uh, and we've built our business there. So it's been, it's been filling in, if you like, the white or white earth spaces and we're very encouraged by, by the, the, the platform we now have not just people, but also technology and connectivity with clients. And in terms of the ECB, what are you expecting from the ECB this year? And I'm trying to get a sense of how that works itself through the business. We saw a little bit of weakness, a little misses on the private bank, uh, the, the commercial bank, IB outperforming. Is that the story now? Net interest income dead? We're going to... Well, no. I mean, so, so there was certainly, a, and we talked about this with investors on the 1st of, of February, a year-on-year -year decline in net interest income. Yeah. Absolutely, we called for... Um, and, and we're seeing that pressure, you know, roll through those businesses. Interestingly, the the, the performance there is better than we'd anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so deposit, particularly in the private bank, by the way, and here in Germany, deposit margins have held up better than we thought. Um, there's been some volatility in sort of what I'll call non-repeating elements of non-interest income, but the underlying performance has been quite stable in the banking book business at, at about 3.3 billion of revenues on a quarterly basis. And so the path that we think we'll now walk from here is a little bit further down in Q2 and then a recovery in the, in the back half of the year in, in interest income in those two businesses. And so what are you expecting from the ECB? Do you feel that inflation is under control in Europe? We, we would align with the, the market sentiment that yeah. June is the, is the beginning of, of uh, the sort of cut in, in, in cutting rate cycle. Um, you know, Europe has been, if not in recession, in, in a much slower growth mode. Um, uh, I think the transmission mechanisms vary across the countries here, but mm -hmm. have been felt in the economy of, of interest rates. Um, and so, uh, you know, we think that that cyclical sort of uh, point has been reached, and which is actually encouraging for growth as I look to the back half of this year and into 25, and as you've seen more recently, and some of the numbers in Germany have started to, to in increase as well, manufacturing activity and what have you. So that seems like a, an encouraging outlook to us. So when you, when you speak to clients, what's driving their decisions right now? Is it the fact that we get that first cut in June? Is it the fact that we're actually gonna get fewer cuts than anticipated, or is it the Fed? I think it's the general outlook for the global economy. Um, so, so our clients, especially corporate clients, you know, manufacturers, yeah. are looking at, at growth in their, in their sales markets um, and how they're positioned to, to, to meet demand. 
Um, you know, one indicator for us is going to be loan growth, uh, which is has also been slower to, mm. to, to start to, to build than we'd anticipated. We've been running flat essentially in the past couple of quarters and have been anticipating some, some, some increase in demand. Now, there's a variety of factors at work there as well, but we, we do think that momentum is there and will begin to make itself felt. Do interest rates play a role? Sure, they play a role. Um, but I think the general mm -hmm. outlook and confidence in the economic direction is, is, is more, more powerful. And you think that, that is gonna be, there's going to be a catalyst for growth in Europe in the back half of the year? Because I think a lot of people are very reticent to give that forecast. I think the catalyst, it, the, the, the general environment and catalysts are there. Again, to move away from interest rates, although a declining interest yeah. rate environment will be supportive of growth. I, I think just as you, as you go through the, the, the back end of a cycle, I mean, take real estate as an example, mm -hmm. and the construction trades here in Germany, that's been through a, a, a really a two-year decline, and, and eventually it finds a floor and a, a point from which you know developers and 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 builders you know find confidence with the the, the prices in the in the real estate market you know hit, find a floor and, and we grow from there. James von Moltke, Deutsche Bank's CFO, speaking to Bloomberg's Oliver Crook on the back of that beat for the earnings coming through from Deutsche Bank with a particular focus on the fixed income tree team and the trading and sales um, upside that came through there. Staying on the earnings story, ATOS, the French IT company, of course, it struggled with a number of accounting issues and, of course, downgrades. Coming out with its latest earnings, and it's a miss in terms of the first quarter revenue, 2.48 billion uh, euros. The estimates had been for around 2 Point eight billion euros year on year. They have seen uh, a little bit of holding back in terms of some of their clients not signing on to new contracts. And importantly as well, delaying a deadline uh, for some of these new creditor proposals as well. Pushing that deadline back from Friday of this week to May the 3rd and saying they may need to raise fresh funds and cut more debt as well. So those are some of the key lines coming through from that French IT company. Again, first quarter revenue coming in with a drop, a contraction of 11% year on year. Switching focus from tech to the drug space. And it's a different story coming through for Sanofi. It's a beat, in fact, particularly when you look at the sales numbers for this French drugs maker. Sales at 10.46 billion euros. The estimates had been for 10.3 billion euros. So a beat there in terms of the sales for a business that, again, is also trying to, trying to restructure and focus on some of its key drugs, trying to carve off uh, other parts of the business, uh, less well-performing parts of the business. And in terms of the new drugs in its pipeline, one really standing out, which is focused on its haemophilia products and one of its haemophilia medicines, um, getting strong pickup in the US as well. So investors will no doubt be scrutinizing that. We know there was going to be a lens on some of their new drugs within that pipeline. The stock, by the way, down about 11% in the last 12 months. They have reaffirmed their financial guidance, Snoffy, for 2024. They've reiterated their EPS guidance for the year. And again, first quarter EPS beating the estimates for Sanofi. There's plenty more coming up, including more earnings, of course, in the banking space. We've had BNP Paribas, we've had Deutsche Bank, a beat from Deutsche Bank, a miss from BNP. Here in the UK, Barclays earnings dropping 7 a.m. UK time. Really interesting, given the restructuring happening at that lender as well. Meanwhile, 4.45 p.m., Boeing was yesterday their key rival, Airbus, reporting earnings. 4.45 p.m. later today, Boeing earnings as well. So think about whether or not they get an uplift from the challenges of Boeing. Getting more aircraft out to, of course, their clients is a key challenge for them as well. Meanwhile, U.S. earnings, big tech, of course, still in focus. The disappointment, the concern around Meta, well, it switches the focus to Alphabet, of course, Google parent later today, and Microsoft, Amazon, and Intel. To what extent is the AI story proving a drag in terms of costs for those companies or, in fact, coming through with a bit of a lift? Those details out later today. Coming up. On the energy front, Anders Oppidal, the Equinor CEO, joining me as the energy giant reports a revenue beat. That is next. His views on the outlook for oil and gas and how they're shifting to renewables. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, Equinor has reported a decline in first quarter earnings as a result of lower gas prices. But the Norwegian energy giant's numbers were better than the previous quarter, with higher liquids output offsetting some of that weak natural gas demand that we've seen in Europe. Let's bring in then the CEO of Equinor, Anders Opperdel. Of course, the Norwegian government is the largest shareholder in this company. Anders, your take on these results and what it tells us about how the business is positioned for the quarters ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, yes, we are well positioned to the to the, to the fu a future. We had very strong results uh, this quarter, as you, you mentioned, uh, driven by production growth uh, in uh, in oil and gas and really solid uh, oper operation, enabling a very strong uh, cash flow from operation of 5.8 billion US uh, dollar. We have an active uh, project portfolio, both in renewables and also in oil and gas. So we are well positioned uh, for uh, future uh, earnings as well. And of course, we focus on, on the European gas storage story, which has seen what works quite a remarkable turnaround, of course, in the last two years, Anders. What, what is the investment case for Equinor now? You were essential during the start of that conflict, uh, Russia invading Ukraine and the gas challenges there. There's an argument that you're less essential now. What, what is the investment case for your business at a place and a time when the inventories and the stockpiles of gas here in Europe are full? Uh, you're right, of course, that uh, the gas prices are substantially lower prices now than they used to be, you know, pre-war and also uh, just before the war and, dur and during the war. And it's been so essential that Equinor have been able to produce gas to Europe to to have energy security for Europe. But we're still producing at an extremely high level uh, for gas production uh, from Norway. Remember, we can deliver gas to all the liquid hubs uh, in Europe, and we can do it at a very low production and transportation cost. So we are very much well positioned uh, for future gas investments from the Norwegian continental shelf, also to, to gas uh, deliver gas to Europe uh, that uh, will need it also in the future. And also remember that the gas prices in Europe are now set by the LNG price. Before, it used to be set by the uh, pipe uh, gas uh, uh, costs. Now, it's set by the yeah. LNG uh, costs. So we see a very good investment case for gas also in the future towards Europe. What, what's your outlook for, for gas prices then to, towards the end of this year, particularly when we think about the Middle East tensions as well, Anders? Yes. Uh, so uh, what, what you, as you said earlier is uh, Europe is well positioned in terms of gas storage now. It's been uh, another mild uh, winter in, uh, in Europe. So Europe is in a good position in terms of storage for next year and are able to fill up the, the storages. But we know that the, the weather, the energy supply, the demand increase in, in China, also uh, some industry demand pickup in Europe will all affect uh, the prices. Uh, we see the market is fairly well uh, uh, now balanced, uh, but uh, there are you know small changes uh, in uh, energy politics uh, and the supply chain disruption. You know can have uh, big changes in the in, in the gas prices. So we are uh, think it's a, a slight uh, upside risk to higher prices uh, in uh, in the future. OK, it's interesting that you tie in politics. The Labour Party here in the UK, well positioned, according to the polls, to take over as the next leaders of the government here, here in the UK. Um, the, the opposition Labour Party is saying that they would, they would remove the current investment allowance for oil and gas projects in, in the North Sea. If that happens, will the economics of the Rosebank project that you have there still hold up? First of all, I would like to say that uh, it is important for any government to make sure that we have stable frame conditions for these long-term investments, both in renewables and, and also in, uh, in, in oil and gas. It's a little bit too early to say the effect of a proposal that might come if they get into uh, government. Uh, but of course, we, we will have to look at this type of uh, proposal and see what it means to our future business and then make uh, kind of the necessary de decisions. All kind of these changes and proposed changes create an additional risk that we need to bring into our risk management of the company. There were some unplanned maintenance issues for some of the projects last year. You had the strikes as well, the disruption there. Uh, you talk about some of these uncertainties, Anders. Uh, what, what is your expectation around potential disruptions as we look to the summer season? 
those uh, disruptions, they were uh, kind of one-offs uh, due to uh, special uh, cases. We have seen over the first quarter solid operations, very high production uh, efficiency. We are off also this year uh, planning some uh, maintenance, but this is planned maintenance and well communicated to the market. So our production guidance, uh, as we presented earlier, is stable and we expect uh, good production from, from, from uh, Equinor also over the next uh, quarters according to our guiding. You talk about the new projects that are coming online. There will be some, some of your investors, some of the minority shareholders, the likes of uh, Saracen and Partners here, here in London, who would say that that runs counter to your targets around, around the Paris Agreement on, on climate. Is there, is there more that you can do specifically to address those concerns, Anders? What we are focusing on uh, is really to lower the emission, both on the methane and the CO2 emission while we're producing oil and gas. And this oil and gas is definitely needed uh, these days. I just visited uh, the Hanover Fair and talked to the German industry and they really need oil and gas from Norway while they are uh, transitioning. At the same time, we are also building up uh, our renewable portfolio, transportation and storage of CO2 for the hard to bait uh, in industry. So we are over time investing both in oil and gas, lowering our emissions, but at the same time also into new uh, energies that will have a lower carbon emissions uh, over time. You were recently in uh, northern Norway um, talking about potential production uh, increases out of, out of Barents. Um, what, what are the plans there, Anders? What, what can you bring online uh, from, from that part of the world? Well, uh, in the northern Norway, we have the Hammerfest LNG, a really important LNG plant for energy security to, to, to Europe. Uh, we are uh, taking this and uh, using power from shore now such that we can actually produce LNG from this plant from 2030 and onwards without any CO2 emissions. And I think that is hard to compete with. Um, in addition, uh, this year, we will start up the Casper uh, field uh, in, in this area. And uh, we're also focusing on see how we can come to a FID on the wisting field. And we also have exploration activity uh, in this area. So the activity level in the Barren Sea is quite high at the moment. Before we let you go, Anders, I just wanted to get, to, to get your view on, on, on something that a lot of our guests talk about, which is this valuation gap between European oil uh, and, and gas majors and their US, US counterparts. Uh, do, do you think that closes any time soon? Does it, does it concern you? Do, do you expect that valuation gap uh, to reduce in, in the quarters and years ahead? Well, it's uh, difficult to say. It's really in the investors that will decide on that. What I can focus on is to really ensure that we are delivering uh, oil and gas, high uh, production efficiency, making our business more resilient and demonstrating high value creation to our in investors. And then I'm sure that we we'll put the right uh, price on our stock. Anders Oppedel, thank you very much indeed, the CEO of Equinor. We appreciate it on the back of those earnings. Now for some other stories making the news this Thursday. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez says he's considering resigning due to the attacks that he and his wife have faced in recent weeks. This comes as a court launched an inquiry targeting Sanchez's wife for alleged influence peddling. The Spanish PM has halted all public duties and says he will be announcing his decision on April 29th. U.S. State Secretary, Secretary of State Antony Blinken has raised concerns over unfair trade as he began talks in China. This comes amid a worsening rift between the world's two biggest economies with a threat of U.S. sanctions over Beijing's support of Russia. And President Biden has signed a $95 billion national security package into law that includes fresh assistance to Ukraine. The move allows the U.S. to quickly resume arms shipments to Kyiv. Officials also acknowledging for the first time they will include a longer range ballistic missile system long sought by Ukraine. There's plenty more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Scaling CapEx and energy expenses for AI, uh, we'll continue focusing on operating the rest of our company efficiently, uh, but realistically, 
Even with shifting many of our existing resources to focus on AI, um, we'll still grow our investment envelope meaningfully before um, we, we make much revenue from uh, some of these new products. Okay, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg trying to assuage those concerns about the uptick in spending and the slightly softer outlook coming through from Meta. The first quarter results were actually pretty decent in terms of the revenue that came through in the quarter, actually up 27%. And you saw profit more than doubling to 12.4 billion US dollars. None of that, though, really mattering as far as investors are concerned, even those smart investors, quote unquote, that, Met that Meta's CEO was alluding to, because it is the outlook and it's the spend. Uh, close to and up to 40 billion US dollars is what they're planning to spend around AI, and that increase cause that concern. And you see that reflected after hours in terms of the move lower, and it is a sharp move lower. For a stop, by the way, that of course has rallied year to date on the optimism around the AI bets and how that's folding in to platforms like Instagram, Facebook and WhatsApp, which of course all fall under the meta umbrella, down 15%. And so far, of course, those words from Zook not really doing much to assuage those concerns. So smart investors see that the product is scaling. Well, they have questions, of course. It spends and it takes a lot of money to build out that AI infrastructure. Let's flip the board and see the read across to other big tech. You've seen the ripple across, across the Asian markets, of course. And this then was that ripple to some of the other big names. Amazon, Alphabet, Microsoft. By the way, those big companies, Amazon and Alphabet. Alphabet, I should say, and Microsoft reporting later today. So we'll see if the AI story for them is slightly different. And Microsoft, of course, with that huge stake in open AI. Another story that we're focused on today, above and beyond the tech story, is what's happening with the Japanese yen. Do they intervene before that decision from the BOJ? The BOJ is meeting right now. But volatility, expected volatility, the highest level that we've seen all year. 155, you're at three decade loads for the Japanese yen. Do they interview, intervene before the policy decision from the BOJ? Uh, remains a key question. We get that decision on Friday. But also, of course, so much of this is about the US story and that key inflation gauge, the PCE that comes out of course, later on Friday uh, could be a factor as well in terms of how we think about the rate differential between the Federal Reserve and Japan. We've had comments from the finance ministry over in Japan saying that he is continuing to monitor what is happening with this currency. And again, one of the worst performers, if not the worst performer amongst the G7 currencies, 155.64, as we continue to watch potential intervention for that currency. The volatility as well, let's flip the board and see that volatility story. Again, spiking at kind of the levels that we haven't seen all year around this potential intervention move from the authorities. Hasn't happened yet, they're on watch. Plenty more earnings interviews coming up here on Bloomberg, including exclusive conversation with CS Venkatakrishnan, the CEO of Barclays. That's in about five minutes. Plus, interviews with the CFOs of BNP Paribas and AstraZeneca, and later, the Airbus CEO speaking to us. That conversation, 7.40pm UK time. Mark us today next.